Thank you for joining me today on this discussion around climate change and its importance to Australia and to the world. And the title is an interesting one that I'm going to talk about a little bit more on the next slide. But what I'm going to be trying to do is to talk about um, climate change, why it is an important issue and has been an important issue for the last 20 or 30 years or more. And in particular, looking at the impacts of climate change, updating the science around climate change so that it's relevant to 2020. And in particular, what I'm going to be looking at is both the impacts and how we have to adapt to the impacts of climate change, but also in the context of the title here, why we also have to seek to minimise future climate change so that we can avoid the unmanageable impacts of climate change. And the title, in fact, came from a report from 2007 that was specifically called Confronting Climate Change and was prepared by an expert scientific group from the United Nations Foundation released in 2007 and that introduced this title about avoiding the unmanageable but managing the unavoidable. And you'll see on this slide the key conclusions from 2007 from their assessment of climate change. And those conclusions are still very relevant today. And in fact, you could argue, and I will argue, that these conclusions are so relevant that they're the conclusions that are just could be used at the end. I'm not going to come back to these words, but I'm going to start with these conclusions. Yes, global climate change is driven largely by the combustion of fossil fuels and by deforestation, all from human activity, that this is a growing threat to human well-being and to the global environment. And those impacts affect both developing countries as well as the developed world together. That significant harm is happening from climate change and will get much worse as climate change increases. There are much greater damages in the future. And what we have to do is to seek to avoid increasing impacts of climate change. And what we also have to do is to make sure that we can limit climate change, limit global warming so that it does not become a catastrophe. Now, if we accept the science as we have done with COVID-19, accept the science, we can avoid the worst impacts of a catastrophe. In this case, a catastrophe associated with human-caused climate change, not the catastrophe that we are already experiencing with COVID-19. So let me go on and look at what's happening with observed climate change. What do we expect to happen in the future in terms of impacts? And then what do we have to do to minimise those impacts? What I want to talk about now is what's happened globally in terms of climate variations since that 2007 report, as well as a little bit later on, what's going to happen in the future. And the first part that I'm going to focus on is the graph in the top left hand side, the global average temperature variations from multiple observational analyses of the temperatures from 1850 right up till 2019. We can also see on there, these are temperatures taken with respect to the pre-industrial period, the 1850 to 1900 average, where we've got some enough data sets. And what it shows is temperature variations or anomalies relative to that baseline. And what we also see is shown on here a one degree above pre-industrial level. And we can see quite easily that the global average temperatures show increases up and down from year to year, natural climate variations, decade to decade variations. But we've also seen a very pronounced global warming. Global average temperatures have risen now by more than one degree, about 1.1 degrees relative to pre-industrial levels. What we also have to try to understand, not in only that the temperature's warmed, but what it's due to. And I'm going to look at that a little bit, but the clearest evidence of the causes of that is it's an enhancement to the greenhouse effect, the influence of increases in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And some so-called commentators or experts comment 
that actually the warmer global temperatures lead to the release of carbon dioxide from the oceans. Well, they're wrong, and I won't specifically name some of those media commentators, but what I'm going to show on the bottom right-hand side in this graph is two separate graphs, not only from 1850, but in fact over the last millennium, over the last thousand years. And we can see here the two separate graphs. We can see the time variations of carbon dioxide here, and it increases very, very rapidly. And the scale shows that the carbon dioxide was around 280 parts per million for about 900 years over the last thousand. And then it increased very, very rapidly since the Industrial Revolution. And the concentrations now are around 400 parts per million. At exactly the same time, there's another graph shown here. And there are, in fact, two different isotopes of carbon dioxide available or occurring in the atmosphere. One with carbon dioxide made with carbon-12 carbon in the carbon dioxide, and another one with carbon-13, slightly heavier isotope of carbon dioxide. Turns out that photosynthesis fractionates the carbon dioxide. Photosynthesis takes up the lighter carbon-12 carbon dioxide more rapidly than the carbon-13 carbon dioxide. Now, the photosynthesis is associated with the production of plant material, whether it's fossilized plant material that goes into production and generation of fossil fuels tens and hundreds of millions of years ago, or when land clearing chops down trees and they decay and release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So if we burn fossil fuels, we'll get photosynthetically processed carbon dioxide. If we chop down trees and they decay through land clearing, we will also get photosynthetically processed carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And what have we seen? Well, we can look at this graph of the carbon-13 amount in the carbon dioxide relative to carbon-12 carbon dioxide in the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The carbon-13 fraction has declined, and this means that we're seeing an increase in photosynthetically processed carbon dioxide. Photosynthetically processed carbon dioxide from burning fossil fuels and photosynthetically processed carbon dioxide from the decay of plant material from land clearing. That demonstrates very, very clearly that the increase in carbon dioxide is due to human activity. Burning fossil fuels or land clearing and is not due to the release of carbon dioxide from the heating up of the oceans. That is an important factor, the heating up of the oceans, but it's not the dominant cause of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That's due to burning fossil fuels and land clearing. That, to me, is the most important slide that I'm going to show because it combats all the misinformation that's provided by some so-called experts in the media. Carbon-13 is still being produced by cosmic rays impacting and being absorbed by carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So you'll get with essentially more protons associated with carbon dioxide that's being uh, impacted by high energy protons from cosmic rays. So let me go now to another really key point. Globally, we look and hear about global warming, which is the average of temperatures in the ocean, at the ocean surface and over the land. We know that essentially land makes up about one third of the surface area of the, of the globe, even if we're including Antarctica. But when we talk about global average temperatures, most people do not live on the surface of the ocean. I often say most people are not fish. They live on land. And so what we should really be talking about in terms of climate change is the global land average temperature. And very rarely do you see that. So let's look at the global land average temperature. That's what's shown here in these graphs. And we see here the scale on the left-hand side in degrees Celsius for the global land average temperature year-to-year -year variations from 1880 right up to the present. And the increases from essentially minus 0.5 degrees Celsius up to more than one, nearly 1.3 degrees Celsius. In other words, a warming of 1.8 degrees, land average temperature. But remember, I said the global average has only increased by about 1.1 degrees relative to pre-industrial. 
In other words, the conclusion from this IPCC assessment in 2019 is that since the pre-industrial period, the warming of land averaged over all land surfaces is about double. Now, I argue that they've exaggerated a little bit. It's only 1.7 times the global area average temperature. One and two thirds. It's less than double. Well, let's think about one and two thirds because remember that number later on. But what it does mean is when we're talking about global warming and we're trying to limit global warming to two degrees, one and two thirds of two degrees is actually close to three and a half degrees. So people will be experiencing three and a half degrees of land average warming when we're trying to limit global average warming to two degrees. How often have you heard people talk about limiting global warming to over three degrees when all you hear about is limiting global warming to two and a half degrees or two degrees and less? So really important point. And the other part is if we're talking about heat waves, we're talking about agricultural impacts, terrestrial ecosystems, desertification, all of the impacts are on the land in those areas. Well, now let me focus on Australian climate change because Australia has experienced the impacts of global warming as to have all countries, all continents around the world. And if we look at Australian temperature increases, we see that the pattern of change in time is a little bit later or slower than the global average warming. Global average warming started around 1900 or so, but in Australia, we did not get any pronounced warming until after 1950. And then there's been a very rapid warming of more than 1.5 degrees from about here on this scale, minus 0.5 degrees to above one. In other words, a warming of about 1.5 or 1.6 degrees in only the last 70 years. Consistent with land warming up faster than the oceans and consistent with the increases in global average temperatures. But Australia has warmed faster than the global average. Australia is surrounded by lots of oceans and actually the oceans have warmed up more slowly and taken, particularly in the Southern Ocean, it's very big and it has lots of deep mixing. So that particularly the Southern Ocean has warmed more slowly than the tropical oceans and more slowly than the mid-latitude oceans in the Northern Hemisphere, just because it's so big, well circulated by the currents traveling around Antarctica, which are essentially mixing as well as the deep ocean circulation. So the Southern Ocean has warmed less quickly than most other oceans in the world. The record hottest temperature across Australia was in fact the annual average temperature in 2019. We set a new record high Australian average temperature in 2019 associated with also record low rainfall in 2019 and the extreme bushfires and drought that affected much of Eastern Australia through the latter part of 2019. We think that the Southern Ocean will continue to warm less quickly because of the deep downwelling that take downwelling motion in the oceans. There are two major downwelling regions. One is the North Atlantic and one is the Southern Ocean. They're both really important because they mix heat from the upper layers of the ocean down into the deeper ocean and they mix carbon dioxide in the largest uptake of carbon dioxide into the deep oceans is happening in the Southern Ocean as well. And it's to do with the very cold and salty water that is formed both in cold regions, but particularly associated with the formation of ice. Because ice formation, ice is made up of fresh water, but you end up with cold and very salty water because of brine rejection when sea ice is formed in the North Atlantic and in the regions around Antarctica. Now, of course, the climate change impacts aren't just dependent upon temperature. There are many, many other impacts of climate change and rainfall is critically important in terms of the impacts of climate change in Australia. And we've seen that in 2019. 2019 was a very unusual year. What has happened to rainfall 
particularly over the last 20 years. We know that rainfall is highly variable across different parts of Australia and varies from year to year. But there are long-term trends. If we look at the cool season, here on the left-hand side of this slide, we see the 20-year average rainfall reported in a report from CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology called State of the Climate 2018. It will be updated this year in 2020, towards the end of the year. But what it shows is the pattern of rainfall changes. And what we see in the red colours is record low rainfall. And in the orange and red colours, essentially measures that are showing much below average rainfall in the most recent 20-year period compared with all the other 20-year periods since 1900. And this record low and much below average rainfall covers essentially most of the southern and eastern part of Australia. Whereas if we switch to the warm season on the right-hand side of this slide, what we find is actually blue colours, much above normal rainfall and in fact the most recent 20 year period has had record high rainfall in the wet season over much of northern and western Australia. So very big contrasts between what's happening in winter particularly in southern Australia and what's happening in the warm season or the wet season in northern Australia. Increases in rainfall in the wet season, decreases in rainfall in the winter time. Combine those together and we can look, well, we would expect with higher temperatures and very dry conditions, such as we experienced in 2019, extreme fire danger conditions. And that's exactly what we experienced in 2019. And this image shows the fire danger index for the month of December of 2019 in a scale in which these sorts of, well, I guess they're dark oranges, are the highest on record over a more than 70 year period since 1950 for fire danger in December. And what we see is December 2019 experienced unprecedented fire danger conditions over almost the whole of Australia, but particularly the south and eastern part of Australia. So yes, 2019 was exceptional. Part of it was due to climate change, the long-term warming. Part of it was due to natural variability because natural variability was a major factor in leading to these very dry conditions over much of Australia. I've talked about the past. I want to talk about the future. We're going to look at a series of climate model simulations to look at future projections of climate change. But to do that first, we have to evaluate how well can climate model simulations simulate what's happened in Australia over the last 50 years or over the last 100 years. Remembering that in the climate model simulations that I'm going to be looking at, these are models that were started in terms of their modelled or simulated world back in 1850. And the only changes that they have from 1850 right up to the present are the changes in greenhouse gases and other human influences on the climate, such as industrial aerosol emissions, as well as volcanic eruptions and changes in solar irradiance. Now, the changes in solar irradiance are very small, but I'm going to show climate model projections, one set with all of the different factors included, the changes in greenhouse gases and the human influences, and a second set of simulations, which just have natural factors alone. So let me now show you the results here. And these are average temperatures across Australia from more than 40 different climate model simulations, showing in the blue band, the simulations you would get for decade to decade temperature variations just from natural variability of the climate system and volcanic eruptions and changes in solar irradiance. No increases in greenhouse gases, no human influences on the climate. And what you see is, and these are, I should say, the, the range that is shown is for the decade to decade variations. If we look at what is the black line here, the thin line, 
That shows the year-to-year -year variations, and the thicker black line is the decade-to-decade -decade variations. From 1910 to 1950, there's very good agreement of those decade-to-decade -decade variations with just the natural simulations, well, the simulations of the climate model with just natural variability. Good agreement, in fact. If you then add the increases in greenhouse gases for the simulations over Australia, you wouldn't have actually expected any substantial warming in Australia from increasing greenhouse gases until around 1940 to 1950 as well. And then over the most recent 70 years, from 1950 onwards, you see a pronounced observed warming that I've talked about before, as well as an increase in the model simulated temperatures. Now, the really interesting thing is even if we go to, for instance, 2019, beyond the range of the historical simulations in these climate models, back into the projected future changes, we see that 2019 is well above the decade-to-decade -decade climate variations, but we also see that in some other years, like 2013, recognising that there's lots of year-to-year -year variability outside the long-term change. Global warming doesn't dominate the temperature variations until around the 1920s and 30s, there is still large year-to-year -year variability. Conclusion from that graph is, no matter what some of these so-called experts in the media say, there is a very clear signature that increasing greenhouse gases have warmed the global climate and the Australian climate, and the climate models simulate those changes quite well. The only caveat on that is that actually, rather than the model projected temperatures surrounding or roughly encompassing all the temperatures in the observations, the observed temperatures are lying in the upper part of the distribution. Maybe the global climate models are underestimating the area average temperature changes in Australia. And you can see the same thing as you look into the future. Yes, there's more warming, but even the 29 temperatures, they're well above what we would expect in the 2030s in the model simulations, or they're right at the upper range. What about if we go and look at much further into the future? And what I'm going to do now is look at the set of global temperature variations, and I'm going to use two different scenarios. One scenario, which looks at temperature variations associated with rapid reductions in greenhouse gas emissions from human activity. And a second scenario, which essentially has business as usual emissions. And so the blue scenario here is a very low emission scenario where we've rapidly reduced emissions globally and it's consistent with limiting global warming to well below two degrees. It gives a greater than 50% chance of global warming being less than two degrees throughout the period. That's fantastic. However, if we look at the other set of climate model simulations, and you can see sort of numbers over above these graphs, as well as a range of uncertainties, the models above the graph are the number of different models that were run to represent these changes. And what we see in this second set of simulations is much greater warming. Warming that best estimate is four degrees above the 2000 level. But remember, there'd been warming already before 2000, and you have to add about 0.6 or 0.7 degrees relative to the 2000 temperatures to actually show what this would be as a scale relative to pre-industrial. So we've already expected with these sorts of simulations, warming that is substantially greater than four degrees above 2000 levels, about 4.8 degrees above pre-industrial levels, and the uncertainty range actually is up here. It's at 5.5 degrees in 2100, plus 0.8, it's actually nearly six degrees as a global average warming in some cases. Low probability, but it could still happen. And also shown here is the increases in global mean sea level. Now, global mean sea level is a critically important factor for all the coastlines around the world and also critically important factor for people, for marine life. What we see 
is that yes, there are major ongoing increases in sea level, but the differences between these two sea level curves doesn't seem to stabilize for low emissions when the temperature stabilizes. We can see that the temperature in this low emissions scenario stabilizes around 2050. But sea level rise continues because it takes a long time for the global oceans to warm throughout the depth, and it takes a long time for ice, ice in Antarctica and ice on Greenland to melt. And so we expect ongoing sea level rise for at least the next 300 years or longer, even if we stabilize temperatures in 2050. So we expect of the order of three meters of sea level rise, even if we are able to stabilize temperatures by 2050 at below two degrees. What I'm going to do now is show a movie, an animation of the two different types of climate models with high emissions and low emissions and the global temperatures to show a visualization of how this evolves from year to year and to look at what time, what we see. And actually, for most of the simulation, the one with low emissions and the one with high emissions are very, very hard to distinguish. So let me start this now. And I will show it. And what you see when we look at these animations is time varying year by year. And here is 2018 and 2019. The observed temperatures, remember I said, was a global warming of about 1.1 degree relative to pre-industrial. These are temperatures relative to pre-industrial. 2018, it says 1 degree in the low emission scenario, 1.3 degrees in the high emission scenarios. But the differences here are just year-to-year -year variability. If we run it a little bit, you'll see that in a few years' time, you can actually have the low emission scenario here in 2024 in this simulation showing greater warming. Then the high emission scenario, natural year to year variability dominates the temperature changes from one year to the next until we get substantially higher emissions. So let's run it on a bit further. And I'm going to let it proceed until we end up with a period like 2050. It's only after 2050 that the increases in greenhouse gas emissions start to dominate the warming and we get significantly higher warming in the high emission scenario than the low emission scenario. In this, we can also see that actually the patterns of warming are remarkably similar in the two sets of simulations. Much more warming over land than over the oceans and much more warming at high latitudes. More warming in the inland areas than on the coastal areas. So it's important to think about these patterns when we're looking at the impacts of climate change. And the largest warming is over the Arctic because the Arctic Ocean is cooled by sunlight being reflected from the sea ice. But if the sea ice disappears completely, there will be much more warming. And that's what we expect by 2050. So let's go to the end. Now, unfortunately, we're going to see what this movie or animation shows for warming in the two different scenarios in 2100. And the 2100 simulation for the high emission scenarios shows warming across essentially all of the land masses, which is greater than six degrees, greater than six degrees over Australia. In the Arctic, it's showing warming of 10 degrees or higher. The low emission scenarios show some Arctic warming of the order of six degrees. But fortunately, when we look at Australia in this low emission scenario, the warming is actually only around three to four degrees. So that's much better than six degrees, but it is still substantial. So now let me just show what that model scenario shows and the two different sets show particularly for the low emission scenario. What I'm going to show now is just the global average temperature. For that low emission scenario, the aim was to try to limit global warming to well below two degrees. What about two degrees? Well, there's two degrees relative to the pre-industrial. And this graphic shows that between 2050 or 2040 and 2100, 
This very low emission scenario is showing warming or temperatures of the order of two and a half degrees, not well below two degrees, even with rapid emission reductions. And globally averaged, temperature, the warming is greater than six degrees. Why is that relevant to people? Remember, it's pretty easy to take one and two thirds times six degrees because most people live on land. Warming over land is one and two thirds greater. That means 10 degrees of global average land warming around the globe. That means massive impacts. And let's look at some of those impacts because this is a graphic that was released from the Bureau of Meteorology and CSIRO now four years ago, summarizing the different impacts of climate change, the things that we have to seek to manage to avoid. And I'm going to go around this in a sort of clock type approach, starting at one o'clock or thereabouts. Tropical cyclones are actually projected to decrease in frequency in future Australian climates, but increase in intensity. We hear about tropical cyclones increasing, and that's true in terms of hurricanes in parts of the United States or affecting the United States. But in Australia, tropical cyclones are expected to decrease in number, but increase in intensity. Extreme rainfall events are expected to increase because a warmer atmosphere holds more moisture. 2019, unfortunately, is a classic example of the worst case, a hotter temperature and drought conditions in southern and eastern Australia, such as we experienced in 2019 and early 2020, is harsher fire weather. And that's exactly what we've been experiencing, increases in fire danger and fire weather, as I showed already. And we also expect continuing dry conditions in southern Australia, particularly in the cool season. For the foreseeable future, while climate change continues, with an increase in the frequency of droughts. I'm going to skip the next one. We know there's going to be more hot days and increases in temperature. The other impact that we see is increases in ocean temperatures and the impact of increasing ocean temperatures on marine ecosystems, like the Great Barrier Reef, leading to increases in frequency of coral bleaching. But there's also impacts from the increases in carbon dioxide dissolved in the ocean, leading to increases in acidity or ocean acidification. I've already talked quite a lot about increases in sea level rise ongoing for the next 300 years, in addition to global temperatures increases. So what do we have to do if we want to minimize temperature changes? It's important to also consider having looked at the impacts of climate change and the projections into the future and having shown how large they are, to now look at what we have to do to mitigate climate change, to avoid the unmanageable catastrophic impacts of climate change. And to do that, we have to rapidly reduce human emissions of greenhouse gases. And this graphic now shows what magnitude of changes are needed in terms of human-related emissions of carbon dioxide and other long-lived greenhouse gases. And what we can see here is the changes in 2010 in terms of greenhouse gas emissions from human activity. And what we have to do if we want to limit global warming to below two degrees or around two degrees, we've got to limit emissions to zero. We have to target a transition of our economy and all human activities to zero net emissions of carbon dioxide and other long-lived greenhouse gases so that we can limit the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere to well below 450 parts per million. Now these concentrations here are what's called carbon dioxide equivalent concentrations. This is a measure not just of carbon dioxide, but the other long-lived greenhouse gases like methane, like nitrous oxide, like chlorofluorocarbons. If we look at our current concentration of long-lived greenhouse gases, it is more than 500 parts per million of carbon dioxide equivalent. CO2 is only at 410 parts per million, but the other greenhouse gases are also very important. 
What are we looking at in terms of business as usual? Well, yes, this shows this business as usual projections and four to five degrees of global warming. Where are those emissions coming from? Well, those emissions are coming from a number of different sectors in the global economic system. Yes, we've got to recognize some of the things that Tony Abbott said as Prime Minister are critically correct. Coal was a key to the development of industrial society and burning coal drove the energy sector and the energy use as part of the Industrial Revolution. What he forgot to say was that coal was good for society rather than coal is good for society because now we have alternatives. But yes, greenhouse gas emissions from the energy sector are still the largest contributor to global greenhouse gas sources. The second biggest sector is greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture and then from industry and from transport. Well, emissions from the building sector, primarily associated with the production of concrete, are also important. But there are many, many different sectors. And if we only address emissions reductions from, say, the energy sector, we're going to avoid or miss out on limiting the emissions from all the other sectors. The hardest sector to limit is emissions from the agriculture sector. Our global population is increasing, and that's a major contributing factor to the increases in emissions. But agriculture is critically important, providing food for people. And as the population grows, there are no easy zero emission food sources associated with agriculture and food production. We can limit and reduce our emissions from the agriculture sector, but there's no easy solutions. Australia did have a carbon market. It had a carbon pricing system. It allowed trading of uh, carbon credits and things like that uh, associated with the carbon pricing scheme and was going to join with the EU in an international carbon pricing system. But the Australian electorate decided that it wanted to close that carbon pricing system in Australia. Since then, and for the subsequent four to five years, Australian emissions grew across all sectors except some aspects of electricity generation and um, some aspects of the, uh, if you like, land use related emissions. Australia still has a carbon market that allows trading in emissions. It's just that people and companies get a credit or get paid through what's called the emissions reduction fund. And companies get paid for reducing their emissions, but there is, and it's possible, to do a trade in effectively carbon credits. At present, it's just been hidden because for reasons that I don't fully understand, while economists say that the best solution is markets for limiting goods and producing, if you like, goods at the lowest cost, the Australian government does not appear to be wanting to allow trading in carbon emissions or carbon credits or prices on those emissions, although there is, through the Emissions Reduction Fund, a price on per unit tonne of carbon dioxide not emitted. The countries around the world have been meeting regularly as part of the conferences of parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And in Paris in 2015, they recognised that slowing climate change, they needed a target to limit global warming to well below two degrees and asked each country to make their commitments to limiting global warming by identifying their shared commitments to reducing emissions in each country. Australia made a commitment to reduce its emissions. The United States made a commitment. All countries made commitments to reduce emissions relative, well, by 2030, in order to limit global warming to well below two degrees. They also made commitments to seek to 
provide extra finance to support adaptation and to provide, if you like, improved science and to limit, improve the ability to adapt to climate change. Now, what I'm going to do in a couple of slides is look at what that commitment of limiting global warming to well below two degrees and what might be needed to limit global warming to one and a half degrees because the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in 2018 released a report on the benefits or advantages from limiting global warming to well below two degrees. And what they concluded was if it was possible to limit global warming to only one and a half degrees, only about 0.4 degrees from where we are now, there would be significantly lower impacts. There would be much reduced impacts if global warming could be limited to one and a half degrees relative to two degrees. And even limiting global warming to two degrees would limit impacts substantially lower than where we're heading at present. Even if all countries meet their Paris Agreement commitments, global warming is likely to get to 3.4 degrees or more if all countries meet their commitments. So if we're trying to limit global warming, we need much more action. And the conclusion from this one and a half degree report from the IPCC is that it's actually countries in the Southern Hemisphere subtropic, countries like Australia, that are projected to experience the largest impact on economic growth due to the impact of climate change. It says, should global warming increase, but we know that global warming's already increased and it's going to get much worse. So yes, Australia is one of the most adversely impacted countries. It's not the whole of the Southern Hemisphere, it's the land masses in the subtropical Southern Hemisphere. And the reason it has bigger impacts is the subtropical regions in the Southern Hemisphere are relatively dry. All of the subtropics are relatively dry. But it's because some of those regions in the subtropics have, if you like, substantial economic activity. And this is South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Chile, and Argentina. Subtropical regions in the Northern Hemisphere are also going to have major impacts like Southern California, the Mediterranean and North Africa, and parts of, um, if you like, the, the sort of uh, mid-latitudes in Asia as well. But those regions are also going to have major impacts. It's just that for some reason that I don't quite understand, they picked out that the greatest economic impacts would be in the subtropical southern hemisphere. So what can we do? We already know what can be done in terms of the solutions to limiting emissions. Yes, we have to use more efficient use of energy. And yes, Australia's chief scientist has been talking about the massive benefits of using energy more efficiently. We also have to rapidly transition to zero carbon energy sources. We have to stop using fossil fuels, whether it's coal, oil, or natural gas, and we have to transition to zero carbon energy sources. Like solar power or wind power, we need to also enhance the uptake of carbon dioxide in plants, and then don't chop the plants down, keep them, store them, or increase the uptake of carbon dioxide in soils, through changes in agriculture or increase the uptake of carbon dioxide in the oceans through algal farms or other approaches. But the other critically important thing is we need lifestyle and behavioural change. We have to reduce our consumption. We need to reuse and recycle much, much more. So where are we heading? Well, remember the Paris Agreement in 2015 said we need to rapidly reduce our emissions and set zero emission targets by the end of the century. Well, here is 2015. And you'd think the countries would listen. And if we look at this graphic, which shows the emissions of fossil fuel related carbon dioxide from all countries around the world, it had actually slowed leading up to the Paris Agreement. 
2013, 2014 and 2015 had similar emissions. And then since 2015, after the Paris Agreement, there's been a rapid acceleration of greenhouse gas emissions from burning fossil fuels. Now, 2019 is going to be a peak and 2020 will have lower carbon dioxide emissions from burning fossil fuels, particularly associated with reductions in transport related emissions. We expect about a 3 to 7% reduction in emissions this year from burning fossil fuels just because of the restrictions on travel restrictions and international travel restrictions on industrial activity associated with the coronavirus. Unfortunately, the world hasn't been tracking down and it's unless we take the opportunity of the economic incentives to transition to zero carbon economy, we're going to just get the emissions bounce back up again. We need to take advantage of the economic incentives to transition to a zero carbon economy. Well, what's happened in Australia, this is a graphic now of emissions in Australia from 1990 right up to the present. And the government in Australia set a target way back in the 1990s of limiting Australia's emissions to 5% below 2000 levels in 2020. Here's 2000 and emissions were around 500 million tonnes per year. And here's 2020 and emissions are essentially the same. We do not have 5% lower emissions now but that was the Australian target. What about 2030? Well, they picked a slightly different start date with slightly higher emissions in 2005 and the emissions in 2005 were about 600 million tonnes. The target for Australia was 26 to 28%. Now, that's hard numbers to work with, but 25% is a pretty easy fraction. It's a quarter. A quarter of 600 is 150. So our target for 2030 is 450 million tonnes. Down here, the Prime Minister's been telling us we're on track to be hitting our target. This is the latest emissions projections from the Australian government. They don't look to me as though we're going to hit our target at 450 with current emission reductions. So let me finish now. This is a summary graphic released last year at the United Nations Climate Action Summit, another clock dial. But this one says, what is the latest summary of climate change impacts and climate change emission reduction activities so that we can avoid the unmanageable impacts through mitigation and manage the unavoidable impacts due to adaptation to climate change. What are some of those unavoidable impacts? Well, 2015 to 2019 was the warmest five year period, 1.1 degrees above pre-industrial temperatures. The climate impacts are hitting sooner and harder than had been projected in 2007. We've seen that in Australia in 2019 the massive bushfires and their impact. Unfortunately, despite commitments to limit global warming, we've had a 2% annual growth in carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuels over the last 10 years. We had a record high emissions in 2019 and emissions are not expected to peak until 2030. What do we need to do to limit global warming to two degrees? It's actually Virtually impossible to limit global warming to only one and a half degrees now. So what do we need to do? Well, the best assessment is if we wish to limit global warming to two degrees or lower, we need to triple our global commitments to emission reductions by 2030. Well, Australia's commitment is 25% emission reduction. With no commitment to reduce emissions by 50%, or to go to zero emissions. But if we want to triple emissions, that means 75% emission reduction by 2030. From where we are now, which is 
So that means in Australia, five to 6% emission reductions every year for the next 10 years. Together with continued growth in the economy, because we need the economy to grow, to provide all the employment activities that we need as well. That's a massive increase. And it's a massive increase in all developed countries around the world. But the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change has this commitment that says developed countries should take the lead in combating climate change. Australia signed on to the UN Framework Convention. Australia should be accepting that Australia should be taking the lead in combating climate change. Uh, I'll allow other people to comment on whether they think Australia is taking the lead or not and what aspects of climate change it's taking the lead on, but we'll leave that go. It's critically important to recognise also in terms of consumption and behaviour that not only do we need to change our emissions associated with transport to, say, going to electric vehicles, to using people-powered transport, like bicycles, or walking to go to the shops. But we also need to reduce our emissions associated with food, associated with buildings, have massive improvements in efficiency of appliances, and massive improvements in home insulation. Australia has some of the worst insulated buildings in the world. We want them to be kept cooler in summer, and we want them to be kept warmer in winter. And we wouldn't have to use as much heating in winter and air conditioning in summer. And they're both critically important factors. We need more better designed cities. We need better designed roads. We need better designed houses and all of those. But we also need to think about our consumption as well. Every time we buy something new, it's using up resources. It's using up energy. We need to think about that every time we whatever follow the latest fashion fad or decide that we need more TVs, more cars, more phones and more electrical appliances. Electric power can be generated from essentially renewable sources. The pr production of the goods cannot be generated completely without using raw materials and resources. Key messages. The human influence on the climate system was clear in 2007 and it's still clear. The more we emit greenhouse gases, the more global warming there'll be, and the more will be the risk of severe and irreversible impacts. We've got to limit global warming and we can do it. We can avoid the unmanageable impact. We know the mechanisms. We know what we can do and we can build a more sustainable, prosperous future. But we have to make choices. And the choices we have to make are between the world on the left, for which global warming is limited to roughly two to two and a half degrees, with substantial ongoing mitigation and zero net emissions globally by 2050, or the world on the right, for which Global average temperatures are of the order of six degrees and global land average temperatures are of the order of 10 degrees. That is a very different planet. No humans have lived on a planet like that ever. Humans haven't actually lived on a planet like that even on the left-hand world. But on the right-hand side, the planet is very, very different. Society will very likely be destroyed. Thank you to everyone for listening. If you've got any questions around the climate science, my email address is on this final slide. And I can't promise to answer every email quickly, but I've provided also lots of references and background information, both to support the slides and that you can look at the best reference is an Academy of Science report that's on the list as well. But you can also wade through that 2007 climate change assessment, which was the basis of the title that I've used. What I see around climate change are the massive positive impacts that are happening associated with, for instance, young people 
and the schools strike for climate and young people getting engaged in worrying about their future with climate change. And then secondly, the massive opportunities that have happened with the dramatic decline in prices for solar PV cells and wind power. It is now cheaper to power Australia from solar PV and wind power than it is to develop a new coal-fired power station. And that's the best solution, is when price and science combine together to say these are things are possible. And that's why I think I still can have a positive attitude. Things will get worse and we need to address those through adaptation, but we now have the opportunities to rapidly reduce global emissions and transition to a zero carbon economy. And that's what's important for Australian society and global society.